Hi folks, welcome to this second part of the Stats and Probability Recap for the IB's Math Analysis and Approaches Standard Level course. Once again, this is not produced or endorsed by the IBO. It's just a review that I made for my students in PEI Canada. It doesn't have everything. In the last video, we dealt with binomial probability distributions, expected value, basic probability, and basic descriptive stats. In this video, we'll look at normal distribution, at correlation and regression, at some sampling techniques, and also at one biggie question that puts a bunch of the topics from stats and probability together in one sort of large question. Remember that there are timestamps and downloadable notes in the video description. It probably helps to do this video by pausing and trying the questions yourselves. You can make use of YouTube's many accessibility options. Uh, and also, there are usually a lot of different ways to solve a problem. So don't feel like you need to do it my way. If you have a different method that you're comfortable with, then please use that. All right, let's dive in. The normal distribution, or bell curve. So we're talking about this kind of distribution with a mean right here. And we can move in standard deviations from the mean. We can move however much we want from the mean. But typically, we're thinking about how many standard deviations we are from the mean. Okay, there's actually a point of inflection at the first standard deviation from the mean. Um, and I've done my best to draw it here. It's asymptotic to the x-axis. And what we know is this. 68% of the population is within one standard deviation of the mean. About 95 and these are just approximations of the population, is within two standard deviations of the mean. And about 99.7, or almost everyone, is within three standard deviations of the mean. The curve is symmetrical, so half of the data is below the mean, half of it's above the mean. And there are these things called standard scores, or Z scores. So what I've written here are X, or raw scores, Z scores just count how many standard deviations we are away from the mean. So the mean itself would be a Z score of 0. And then we'd be at 1, 2, and 3. So a Z score of 3 is really, really high. And a Z score of negative 3 is really, really low. It's very far from the mean. We can convert uh, from standard scores to Z scores. I don't know how well this is actually showing up, so this is saying z equals x minus mu over lowercase sigma, okay, where mu is mean and sigma is standard deviation. The most likely situation we'll need z scores is when we need to find the mean or standard deviation. Your calculator has a couple of important functions. In a TI-84, it looks like norm CDF and inverse norm. So norm CDF finds a probability. Inverse norm finds a score. You can also use shade norm, but I don't really like to mess around with the window settings, so I just use norm CDF instead. So let's just make sure that in our calculator we can find some probabilities or areas. First thing I'm going to notice in this question is it's dealing with a Z score. So that means that the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1, anytime we're talking about Z scores. And I'm going to make a little drawing here. This is saying the probability that z is less than 1.83. So here's 1.83. And here's the area we're talking about. In my calculator, I'm going to turn it on, I'll clear everything out. I'm going to press second vars to get to the distribution. And I'm looking for a probability or an area. So I go normal CDF. And it will ask me a question. What's the lower boundary? Well, this goes to negative infinity, so there's no real lower boundary. In my calculator, it's saying negative 1 e to the 99. That's negative 1 times 10 to the 99. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with that, just put in negative 1 and a bunch of zeros. That's really far down. The upper boundary is 1.83. And here I have mean of 0 and standard deviation of 1 because it's a z score. Work it out, it tells me the area is 0.966, which seems reasonable. It seems like it should be bigger than 50% anyways. Similarly for the next one, I could draw it 
here is 0.31, and it's saying probability greater than or equal to 0.31. Now, for normal distribution stuff, don't worry too much whether the uh, inequality has an equals with it as well, so whether it's greater than 0.31 or greater than or equal to. Since it's continuous data, doesn't really make much of a difference. We'll go second, VARS, normal CDF again. In this case, the lower boundary is 0.31, and the upper boundary is a bajillion. So I'm just going to put in 1 with a bunch of zeros. Mean is 0, standard deviation is 1 because it's Z scores, and I get 0.378. Lastly, I always make a picture for these. Negative 0.54. I think there might be method marks in there, possibly, and also, more importantly, I'm less likely to botch it if I draw it. So I go second bars, normal CDF, and I put in the lower boundary is negative 0.54, and the upper boundary here is 1.45, and I'm just going to hit paste and enter. It gives me 0.632. So there it is without context. Now let's do one that is in context. We've got the heights of high school basketball players so that they're normally distributed with a mean of 177 and a standard deviation of 4 centimeters. What's the probability that a randomly selected high school basketball player is taller than 182 centimeters? Hmm, let's draw this. 177 is the mean. Here's 182 over here. I'm wondering about taller than 182. Ah, now I can head to my calculator and go second virus, normal CDF. The lower boundary here is 1.82. The upper boundary, I'm going to put in a bajillion. Yes, I understand that nobody is that tall, uh, but I just want to show that it has, you know, it has no upper bound. So we could have put in more zeros if you like. But here we're not dealing with z-scores. We actually know the mean is 177. We know the standard deviation is 4. And we could paste. And we'd end up with 0 0.106 to 3 sig figs. What's the probability that they're between 169 and 185? So here's 169 and 185. We can just do the same thing. And we can go second VARS, normal CDF. We're never using normal PDF. Lower is 169. Upper is 185. Mean and standard deviation are 177 and 4, respectively. And I get 0.9544, which makes sense because these were actually two standard deviations from the mean, and we said it was about 95%. In a group of 250 high school basketball players, how many do you expect to be 182 centimeters or shorter? So that's going to be 250 times the probability that they're less than or equal to 182 centimeters. And again, whether you have the equals on there doesn't make much of a difference. So I'm going to figure out the probability that they're less than or equal to 182 centimeters. Normal CDF, maybe I'll draw this, just a, just a really rough sketch. Here's 182, and I'm talking about less than. This should be a probability that is bigger than 0.5. That's what I know from that drawing. The lower bound is negative a bajillion, okay? though, of course, you can't have a height less than uh, zero. And honestly, if you put a lower bound of zero in there, I'm sure you'll get the same answer to three sig figs. And we can work this out. Ah, so we have 250 times 0.894. I can just do that all at once. We get 223.58, or to three sig figs, we'll call that 224. Now, you might have also noticed a hack for finding this, given your answer from A. Um, but it wasn't too bad to just go and use the G GDC again. In all of the questions on this slide, we were looking for probabilities or areas. In the next one, we'll look for scores. A test has a mean of 75 and a standard deviation of 13. Results on the test are roughly normally distributed, 
and 80% of test takers are expected to pass. Find the passing mark. Hmm. Here comes the nature of standardized testing. Uh, so we've got a mean of 75, and we know that 80% of test takers are expected to pass. So there are people with you know, comparatively good marks. The ones that fail have the lowest marks. And this is going to be the job of the superhero, inverse norm. Inverse norm finds a score. So I'm going to go second vars, choose inverse norm, and it asks me about area. And here's the snag. The area that I give it has to be area to the left of the score that I'm talking about. This score that I'm looking for, let's call it P for the passing mark. There's an area of 0.2 that we're dealing with. There's a mean of 75 that we're dealing with. And there is a standard deviation of 13. And I can just type that in, and it will tell me that that passing mark is 64.1. We might as well mention at this point, too, that the standard way to show a normal distribution is x tilde, and then we'd say mean and variance. So in this particular case, we'd say it's 75 and 13 squared. It would be kind of mean to write that as 169. Sometimes you'll see it that way, but typically it'll show standard deviation squared. So you may have to decode that as well at some point. All right, here comes one that has a little more to it. The scores on an aptitude test are normally distributed with a mean of 80. Let's draw that. Mean of 80 right here. 90% of test takers score below 96. So here's 90% of them. Find the standard deviation. Ooh, this is a case where we can't just get the calculator to do it directly. When we don't know mean and standard deviation, this tends to be a job for Z scores. So the raw score that we're talking about here is 96. What's its corresponding z-score? In other words, how far away, in terms of standard deviations, is it from the mean? So I'll go second vars. I'm still looking for a score here. I'll go inverse norm. And they've been nice enough to give us area to the left, so that's good. But since I'm looking for a z-score, I'm going to put in mean of 0 and standard deviation of 1. And I'll get one point. 28155. And I'm going to keep a bunch of sig figs for now because it's not the end of the question. And what I'm able to do then is use this handy little formula that tells us how to compute z scores um, from x and mean and sigma. So when we've got a z score of 1.828155, we're talking about a raw score or x of 96. We're talking about a mean of 80 and a standard deviation of sigma. Um, so what's going to happen here? I'll have 96 minus 80, that's 16. In the end, I'll have to divide it by 1.2855. Why don't I just use the numbers that are right up here? And you can do this with more steps if you want, um, but just for the sake of expedience here, I'll just write the answer. You can pause and try it with more steps if, if you want to solve that equation analytically. Our next topic in stats and probability is correlation and regression. So correlation, or Pearson's correlation coefficient, is the statistic that tells us about the strength of the linear relationship between two variables. Correlation values lie from negative 1 to 1, inclusive. So a correlation of 1 means a positive perfect correlation. As one variable increases, so does the other, and they do so perfectly linearly. A correlation of negative one means a perfect negative correlation. That means as one variable increases, the other decreases. Now, you're not likely to see a lot of perfect correlations, but we may see a lot of very strong correlations. So a strong positive correlation would look pretty linear, and it would be increasing. 
a strong negative correlation might look something like this. Quite linear, going in a decreasing direction. Correlation of zero means there's no correlation. It doesn't look linear. It doesn't look like there's much of a relationship between the variables at all. Make sure that your stat diagnostics are turned on if you have a TI calculator. And you can find that under second, zero for catalog, and you just keep going down and down and down and down until you hit diagnostic on. There it is. I hit enter twice, and it's for sure on. Ideally, you've got your calculator set up so when it's in test mode, stat diagnostics are automatically on. If we want to find the correlation coefficient and do some linear regression, here's what we do. We enter our data in list 1 and 2. So I'm going to clear out what I've got by pressing clear, enter in the heading, put in my data, head over to list 2, put in my y's, and now I will take a second to make sure that I've actually put it in correctly because there's not really any part marks here if you botch some of your data entry. Okay, looks good. I'm going to hit second mode to quit. And then I go stat over. And the fourth one is linear regression. If I'm doing a y on x linear regression, which is the standard one, then my x list is L1. My Y list should be L2. There is no frequency list. If I really want to, I can store that regression equation somewhere. So I can hit alpha trace, and it gives me my Y variables. So I could put it in, I don't know, like Y3. And then I'll hit calculate. And it tells me the correlation coefficient, that's R, is negative. 0.979. Now, it is always a good idea to write those leading zeros so that your examiner you know, isn't going to miss a decimal place. The regression equation to three sig figs anyways is going to be negative 1.38. I'm reading that from the A value. Negative 1.38x plus 13.2. And then it says, if appropriate, find, or estimate, I guess would be a better word here, y when x is 3. So we're allowed to do that. We can just put in 3 for x. And we're going to get 9.06. Now, if you stored your regression equation in y equals and put it in, you may get a slightly different answer. You might get 9.08 using stored equation. And that's because it stores more decimal places. Often the IB will ask you to actually write down the A and B values so that you can use them in the next step. So that is okay because we're interpolating. We're using an X value that was between known values. X values here went from 2 to 7. The next question asks us to find Y when X is 10. And we're going to say, no, we're not going to do that. We're very leery of extrapolation. So the first one was OK. It was interpolation. It was between the x values that were known, or the poles. And this last one says, find x when y is 9. And that seems like an OK thing to do. Um, but actually, we should be doing a slightly different regression to, to do that kind of prediction. So no, don't use y on x regression to predict x. And I guess one way that you can think about this, just to keep it straight, is this one says y equals. Use it to find y values. If you want to find x values, well, we're going to use an x equals 1. And you might think that it's just rearranging this formula, but actually the math is slightly different. To do a y on x regression, what it has done is it has minimized the squares of the vertical distance between the known points and the line it's creating. If you do an x on y regression, it minimizes the squares of the horizontal distances. So it's slightly, slightly different. So predicting x from y, in order to predict an x value using a linear regression, we should do an x on y regression, which your calculator does not really want to do. It's going to produce an equation of the form x equals, so I just use different variables here, x equals cy plus d. We're going to go through the same process in our calculator but we'll need to switch lists to represent x and y. Essentially, we're going to trick our calculator. 
The result will be a regression that effectively minimizes horizontal residuals rather than vertical ones. So use an appropriate regression to estimate x when y is 9. I'm going to hit stat. I'll go over to linear regression again. And this time I'm going to tell it that my x list is list 2 and my y list is L1. Now, that's not really what's going on here. L2 still represents a y, but I have to trick my calculator by getting it to sort of switch what each one represents. And it's going to tell me the regression is y equals negative 0.692x. But we switched those lists. We switched those variables. So actually what this means is that x equals negative 0.692y plus 9.35. Okay. We switch it in the calculator, so we also switch it on the page. Now if we want x when y is 9, well, we just go negative 0.692, put in 9 for y, we get 9 .3, plus 9.35, and we work that all through and get 3.12, which seems relatively reasonable. Both of these regressions are going to produce the same correlation coefficient, and both regressions are going to pass through the mean point. So if they ask you what point do they both pass through, um, the x on y regression and y on x regression, it's going to be through this point here, mean of x, mean of y. So the mean of x, we could add them up and divide by 4. We're going to get 4.5. And the mean of y, 11 plus 7 plus 6 plus 4 is 28. Divided by 4 is 7. Okay. No extra work needed beyond that. One last thing that appears in the syllabus that I'm honestly not sure how they're going to incorporate into the exams is sampling techniques. So sampling bias is where you take a sample from the population where some members are less likely to be chosen than others so that it's not representative. Some sampling techniques are convenient sampling, just using whoever's easily available. Simple random sampling, where everyone has an equal chance of being chosen. Systematic sampling, so that's where you choose, say, every 40th person from a list or at some set interval. Stratified sampling, where you divide the population into strata or smaller subgroups based on shared characteristics. And then there's quota sampling that is like stratified sampling, but you take a representative number of people from each strata, from each of those subgroups, to build a proportional sample. So for example, if 60% of the population wears corrective lenses, you might take 60% of your sample from people who wear corrective lenses, which meant at the start you had to split people up into those who wear corrective lenses and those who don't. Note that we don't have to be talking about people to invoke sampling techniques. It just seems to make it a little easier to explain. That brings us to the end of all the techniques that we need to talk about in statistics and probability. I've decided to put on the end of this presentation one sort of classic biggie question. Um, but if you want to tap out here, by all means. Or if you want to take a look at this question, pause the video, and then see how it went, that might be a useful thing as well. OK, here we go. The weights in pounds of Yorkshire Terriers, or Yorkies, are distributed according to this distribution. So what we know here is that standard deviation is 0.7 and mean is unknown. A Yorkie that weighs more than 7 pounds is considered a giant Yorkie. This is true. Suppose that 15% of Yorkies are giant. Let's try and find mu. So I'm going to draw it. 15% of Yorkies are giant. They weigh more than 7 pounds. Mu is unknown. And let's see if we remember anything from before. We're looking for mean or standard deviation. Those are the cases in a normal distribution where you're going to need to find a z-score. Okay. So I can find that z-score um, by heading to my calculator. And I'll go second vars, inverse norm to find a score. And the area to the left is 0.85. The mean is 0. The standard deviation is 1 because we're looking for a z-score or standard score. And I'm going to get 1.0364. That, in turn, lets me use this handy little formula. 
So the z-score is 1.0364. This is a little different from the uh, example we did before, because in this case, mean is unknown. So we'll go uh, 7 minus mean, which is unknown, all over the standard deviation, which is known. And I can times my z-score by 0.7. I get 0.7255 is 7 minus mu. And if I just rearrange that and write it to three sig figs, it's going to work out to be 6.27. Now it asks us, what's the probability that a randomly selected Yorkie weighs less than 8 pounds? Well, let's see. I'm going to draw the distribution. Eight pounds is pretty hefty for a Yorkie. And I want to find this probability or area. So that's a job for normal CDF, okay? Because I want a probability. So really, this is the probability that x is less than 8. And the lower bound, I could make it 0, but I'm going to make it negative a bajillion. The upper bound is 8. The mean we just found is 6.27. And the standard deviation is 0.7. So now we're talking about actual real scores, not Z scores or raw scores. That's why I put in my mean and standard deviation. I hit enter. I get 0.994. Okay. Or sorry, 0.993 to three sig figs. And here comes the classic IB move on these questions. It starts off as a normal distribution question and then it sort of morphs into something else. Suppose 60 Yorkies have a party. It would be a great party. Find the expected number of giant Yorkies at the party. Yeah, so the expected number of giant Yorkies is just going to be 60 times the probability that a Yorkie is giant. Or we get 60 times 0.15, that's 9 Yorkies. This is really turning into a binomial distribution at this point. Okay. And E of X, the expected number, or the mean, is just NP. Now, out of those 60 Yorkies, find the probability that there are exactly 10 giant Yorkies. Again, we've got multiple events, or the same event, a Yorkie, happening multiple times. This is a binomial distribution. So I want to find out what's the probability that there are exactly 10. That is the job of binome PDF. Okay. So let's throw that in. Second, vars all the way down to binome PDF. And we're talking about an event that has 60 trials, that the probability of success, i.e. being giant, is 0.15. And we're looking at an x value of 10. Paste, we get 0.129. And E is a little trickier. Find the probability that there are more than 10 giant Yorkies at the party. So let's think about that. You could go probability of 11 plus probability of 12 plus probability of 13. I mean, I guess you could make some sort of sigma statement, um, but it's going to be very, very painful. The slickest way for us to do this is the probability that there are more than 10. That means the probability that there are 11 or more. Okay, and this time it's because it's binomial distribution, it's discrete numbers of successes. There's no such thing as 10.5 giant Yorkies at the party. Probability of 11 or more is the complement of 10 or fewer. So I can figure out the probability of 10 or fewer with binome CDF. So I choose second vars again, I go all the way down to binome CDF, and there are still 60 trials. It's still a 15% chance of being a giant Yorkie, and we've got an x value of 10. This is the probability of having up to 10 giant Yorkies, which is going to be 0.71628. Okay. And now I just have to go 1 minus that number. So 1 minus the answer that I just found gives us 0 0.284. There's the answer 
for part E. Given that the chosen Yorkie is giant, find the probability that it weighs less than eight pounds. Yeesh, we're gonna need some space. So we're looking at the probability that it weighs less than eight pounds, given that it is giant. And being giant has an operational definition. It means greater than seven pounds. So after all this stuff, it started as a normal distribution question. It went into binomial land. And here we end up in conditional land. Classic IB stuff. X is less than 8 and X is greater than 7. All over probability that X is greater than 7. Now let's interpret that. If something is less than 8 and greater than 7, that means it's between 7 and 8. So now we just have to find these probabilities. This is still a normal question, a normal CDF. We're never using normal PDF, so this would be a distribution with a lower bound of 7 and an upper bound of 8 and a mean of 6.27, we already found that, and a standard deviation of 0.7, and that gives us 0.14. 1778 or 14178 all over. The probability that it's greater than 7 is the probability that it's giant, which is 0.15. And we can just divide those two things out. Okay? We should not leave an answer as a ratio of uh, decimals. Answer should either be a fraction with whole numbers or integers, um, or it should be a decimal. If you've stuck around to the very end, Award yourself one pat on the back. I hope this has been helpful. Good luck with the material, and take care, folks.